Uh, my name is Romina Bandura. I'm a senior fellow here at CSIS. And um, thank you for coming. And this is uh, going to be a very good panel. I have Alling Weddington to uh, my left. He's founder and chairman of Weddington uh, International, an investment and business advisory firm. And he's also a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Axel van Trotgensberg, uh, he has a very small job at the World Bank. He's just vice president of development finance at the World Bank. You oversee IDA, IBRD, and the trust funds. And as Dan mentioned, this is sort of Oscar week for the World Bank, so th thank you for being here. Um, Jeffrey Okamoto um, also has a small job. He's Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Development Policy at U.S. Department of Treasury. He oversees all the efforts to foster economic growth in developing countries and leads the uh, engage, U.S. engagement with the uh, um, multilaterals, the G20, and the Paris Club. And Dennis Detray, uh, he's, uh, he has worked at the World Bank for 23 years in different capacities um, in very difficult uh, countries as well. Uh, he's member of the board of directors at President Nazara Nazbarayev University in Astana, Kazakhstan. So welcome, and uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, this, some of the issues we're going to touch upon are uh, the World Bank is seeking a, a capital increase, uh, I believe about 13 billion between IFC and IBRD. Um, what are some of the uh, reforms that shareholders uh, could seek as part of this capital increase? What should the bank um, invest this money in? How can the World Bank uh, work more in coordination with, with other regional development banks? So very broad topics, but we won't, would like to um, have a take uh, from, from this panel. So I'm going to start with Alin. Um, you have uh, written extensively on, on this topic. You've, um, you're a specialist in Asia. How do you see like the development landscape changing in the next years, and how can uh, the World Bank better maximize its existing resources. Yes, thank you uh, very much, uh, Romana and Dan. Congratulations on this very fine conference. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel uh, with uh, uh, Axel and Jeff and uh, Dennis. Uh, I see many people in the audience. Uh, I would much rather be listening to you than the other way around, as uh, many of you have uh, deep experience over many, many years, and I'm sure have views on this uh, important topic as well. Uh, let me tell you uh, uh, where I come from uh, before I um, uh, go into uh, a couple of uh, more specific points uh, on your opening question, uh, Romina. Um, I believe that uh, uh, the World Bank Group, the MDBs, are a very, very important component of uh, not only American policy, but uh, uh, countries that have been uh, active participants in the creation of the existing order um, uh, within which uh, development banks have played a very important role. Uh, the World Bank in my group has, in my view, has a leadership uh, role to play. Uh, major shareholders, and I include my own country, uh, U.S., uh, in this uh, statement, uh, should be elevating the political priority that uh, uh, they give uh, to uh, this institution and other uh, institutions. I say that for two uh, basic reasons. Uh, one is because of the continued central importance of development to global, uh, sustainable, uh, inclusive uh, growth, uh, but also because I think uh, we do face uh, a challenge uh, to the existing model of development, to the existing order, uh, which comes from China's lending activity. And I hope we have a time, we have some time in this panel to uh, discuss that. Uh, because I think uh, some of its activity in conjunction with deteriorating standards in borrowing countries is in fact undermining uh, the current open, transparent, a public procurement regime that the World Bank and other institutions have sought uh, over time to create. I think uh, going more specifically to your uh, question, um, I think we all know the landscape that uh, the World Bank and other uh, MDBs face. 
Uh, it's one of declining, uh, a declining role globally uh, for uh, public uh, resources. Uh, but those resources nonetheless continue to have vital importance in uh, development uh, strategies of uh, uh, developing countries, particularly poor uh, countries. But that trend does raise a long-term, I think, question of relevance of these institutions, of a need to define uh, their role, of a need continually to demonstrate the contribution uh, that they make to global growth, uh, to uh, uh, equitable uh, distribution of wealth, uh, to the improvement of, uh, of human conditions, uh, the improvement of human capital. Uh, so even though there is a, a decline uh, in uh, public uh, resources as a percentage of total uh, capital available, these institutions continue to play a very, very uh, important role. The, the question of a capital increase uh, for the World Bank is obviously one that is on the table uh, today. Um, I'm not here, I don't know, maybe Jeff or somebody else will be able to enlighten us on where exactly uh, this stands. Uh, presumably it will be addressed uh, uh, this weekend, uh, maybe in a definitive way, I'm not sure. Uh, we will find out, as uh, people like to say these days. Uh, we shall see. Um, but um, uh, it seems to me that the bar uh, for a new capital increase must be rather high, that the burden of proof must be rather strict, must be rather uh, severe, uh, because there, are, there is adequate capital in this world uh, for infrastructure development. The question is unlocking it. The question is mobilizing it. But we must recognize at the same time that there is strong demand, I think, on the part of borrowing countries within the World Bank Group uh, for additional borrowing that must be taken uh, seriously. Uh, so I would not take the position that one cannot demonstrate a need. Uh, it seems to me that the answer to this question is, is can a justifiable case be made uh, based on demand and also uh, can a basket of so-called reforms be put together uh, that reinforces the legitimacy in a political sense uh, for, uh, for uh, this uh, new funding? What would that basket uh, look like? I'm sure there are many uh, different views on that question. Uh, I have my own uh, views on that. I'll give you a couple of thoughts uh, very, very briefly. Uh, before I do that, let me, let me, though, underscore what I think has been, over the last uh, a number of years, a very important trend uh, apparent uh, in the World Bank Group, particularly the IFC, to focus on private solution. Uh, that uh, public resources uh, are there to be deployed, perhaps in a more strategic uh, sense, uh, for purposes of uh, risk mitigation, for purposes of project development, uh, for purposes of improving uh, the enabling environment for uh, private capital. And these institutions, as part of a reform package, uh, need a strong political message that this trend toward greater focus on the private sector uh, must be implemented in a very serious uh, way uh, and with uh, an accelerated uh, uh, political uh, priority. But moving beyond that, let me just say, implementation is sometimes the hardest part of, uh, of uh, reform. Um, I think there are not large uh, new concepts or large new structures that uh, as part of a reform package, uh, the, the uh, major shareholders should be uh, considering. But I do think there are some important elements. Uh, one uh, is to ensure uh, that the institutions are leveraging existing uh, resources. I think, for example, in this category, the uh, equity to loan ratio of the World Bank Group remains uh, too high. It is substantially higher than the uh, most secure of uh, commercial lending institutions. And it could lower that uh, from, from the uh, 
a low 20 level down maybe to the high teens, uh, freeing up additional uh, resources. So that, that, in my view, should be one component of this package. Another is a, a clarification, put it that way, of the graduation policy. Uh, in implementation of that over many, many years, I think, has been lax. Criteria have been vague. And uh, there needs to be a, a tightening of, of that and more clarity, particularly with respect to certain large borrowers. And I would reference in this uh, context uh, specifically China. I think a reform package cannot get through at least the political process here. Uh, plus, I think it's required on the merits, apart from the politics of it, that uh, we take seriously a graduation of countries that very clearly uh, have access to international capital markets. And I say that recognizing that engagement between certain large borrowers and the World Bank uh, may have certain uh, domestic reform benefits. I don't discount the benefit of that uh, relationship. But it seems to me there needs to be uh, clarification on the graduation policy and a clear pathway provided for the graduation of certain major borrowers. And I reference in this context specifically uh, China. Another element of reform might be uh, uh, differential pricing with respect to uh, uh, income levels. Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, that an alteration on that is, uh, is uh, uh, perhaps achievable. And uh, in terms of uh, lending priorities, I think, uh, as is al already underway, a, uh, a, a very strong focus on uh, the poorest of uh, borrowers and also on, um, on uh, fragile and post-conflict uh, states. Uh, those are in no shortage. They are likely to increase, in my view anyway, over the next uh, decade. And I think the World Bank has a very important role to play uh, in that regard. So that might be the outlines of a package, at least from my uh, perspective. But let me close uh, uh, here with one a final point, and it's a point that um, I made at the outset of my remarks uh, with respect to China. Um, I think China's uh, offshore lending practices uh, pose a major challenge uh, to the existing order. Uh, I'd be prepared to discuss that uh, observation in, uh, in detail later on in this uh, panel. Uh, but it suggests to me a number of uh, things are in order uh, uh, in terms of, I'm going to say, shareholder activity. Uh, but I also extend that to uh, multilateral lending institutions, the World Bank as well. Uh, this deserves, because of its geostrategic significance, a much higher place on the political agenda of, uh, of uh, other large uh, shareholders uh, within the institutions. And I say that because I believe that a combination of China's lending practices and practices within borrowing countries are pulling downward a broad set of standards, long established standards that have been encouraged and developed under the auspices of the World Bank Group, the OECD, and some of the regional institutions. And uh, that downward uh, process uh, must uh, be reversed, in my view. And um, we do, in some areas, I think, need clarity on what the rules of the game are with respect to lending institutions. If one is to look, for example, at the OECD arrangement, admittedly, this is not part of the, uh, the World Bank's uh, uh, purview, that is credit, uh, uh, official credit arrangement, uh, we see departure, and this is not just the case with respect to China, but uh, across most major lenders. China is not part of that group, but uh, its practices are undermining compliance uh, with those standards. Uh, we see an undermining in terms of uh, public procurement standards, standards that have been developed by the World Bank and the OECD. And we see an undermining, I believe, of standards related to transparency and integrity. And uh, these cry out, I believe, for um, uh, new action, uh, for new initiatives to create a new set of rules with respect to 
infrastructure uh, uh, development financing globally. Uh, so let me, uh, maybe on that negative note, but I throw that out as a uh, challenge and as a provocative statement for discussion, uh, I'll bring, those, bring my opening comments to a close. Thank you, Romina. Thank you. We'll, we'll discuss China in a bit. I wanted to turn to Axel. Thank you again for being here. Um, what do you think are the main set of issues that are going to impact the World Bank in the, in the near future, and how do you see the World Bank's role? adapting and changing um, the way it operates, its objectives. Good afternoon. Uh, let me start with a very positive uh, note. Is um, The World Bank is one of the few organizations where we have the whole world together. Uh, when it was created, uh, we had only um, a subset of victory and some Latin American countries, and most countries were still uh, on the colonial rule. So um, China rejoined the bank in, uh, in 1980, and then after the Iron Curtain fell, we had actually a truly world bank, and we should be proud of that. Why is that important? Because this is a platform for global co cooperation, that makes it different from regional organization. It makes it also uh, uh, also different, maybe see even sometimes from the UN, because with the finances, it is action oriented and we get things done. And so this is actually the positive news. We have benefited greatly and therefore what we are emphasizing is an inclusive world, not a divisive world. And that is, as we go forward, very important that this platform allows for global cooperation. Clearly, what is the second thing is that the World Bank needs the ability to adjust because the times are changing and if we are not adjusting constantly, you lose relevance. And that is both in the technical sense, on the competency, as well as in the political sense. So you need basically both. And they are be best uh, 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 captured maybe in the negotiations for IDA. That you mentioned that uh, there is a declining role, maybe of all the multilaterals, if you look IDA, it's increasing. It has never mobilized so many resources as ever. Last round, $75 billion. So uh, that shows that you need to be competent, you need to have innovation, and you need to have uh, a political savvy to get the whole uh, coalition uh, together. So that is very important that we go forward. I think if you look, uh, read the Times, uh, I think I would very much agree, is that multilaterals or public money will not do it. It will be an important input, but it is not going to solve alone. But what we can do is be catalytic. So what is important is this private uh, uh, focus. But let me emphasize, the private sector focus cannot be, oh, I'm looking only at the IFC or at MIGA. What needs to be done, and that is happening, is that the operations of IBRD, IDA, the public sector operations, in their content facilitate also a, a public, a private sector solution. Meaning, in its policy uh, operations, seeing where regulatory uh, constraints are, so that you are engaged on the policy dialogue, but also in your infrastructure investments, that that is complementary and not a substitute for the private sector. So those things are extremely important and I think will remain key. To be honest, uh, I have been reading a lot on history. Actually, when you read them back, even in the, uh, uh, just uh, after Bretton Woods, these things were recommended. So this is a constant, but it needs to be constantly lived, and that is, I think, very important. The other part I would say is um, clearly global public goods, namely where are issues where countries or individuals cannot uh, uh, solve it. Think of pandemics, think even on climate change, think of conflict. 
So that is where, where we need uh, multilateral cooperation and we need to be effective. I would say one of the things what is coming is interesting that the whole nexus between development and security that always was you know, almost separated. Oh, well, you deal when the conflict is over, then the World Bank come in or the regional, and, and then this is, uh, this is no longer, you can no longer separate. You need to think about how you uh, move in from Afghanistan, or if you have issues like Yemen, you cannot just sit uh, there and just wait. So this is one of the things, and the, the unfortunate too is fragility is increasing, and that means you need to do more. And this is not only for the poorest countries, so that is a clear focus, but you have also to see on the middle country. I'm thinking here of, of if you take Iraq, you take uh, uh, Libya. These are all issues, but even if you think of uh, uh, Mindanao in the Philippines, where there has been a long-term, these are the realities of the world. You cannot walk away from this, and it will be a key one. I think then is we need to think about the leverage. Uh, uh, clearly, it is about how can we get uh, the private sector leverage. Now, I will say this. The framers of the World Bank, sometimes people get it right. And I think we're extremely smart with, with the, set, the financial setup, with small paid in, high leverage. Just to give you a sense, till today, only 16 billion, a bit over 16 billion have been paid in. It has allowed us to do more than $700 billion in loans. That's a nominal. If you pay, express it in today's value, $1.2 trillion. That's not a bad deal. And, and it's, a, it's a very smart way how that has been done. I think we need to keep that leveraging effect. It is also very effective use of scarce uh, fiscal resources uh, to be uh, done. So my sense is what we will need to do is, is focus clearly on the private sector, but also then on the, on the, on the, on the difficult issues on, on fragility, and my sense is on the global uh, public goods. Finally, you can do that, and you have a good talk, and there's a lot of talk. At the end of the day, you got to deliver. The big difference is we have a lot of talk shops, but if you have money, you have to deliver. So that means you have to have an organization that can deliver in time, not too late in time. And that is the important thing, where, where it is the challenge, of it is that you have an organization that can move billions, but not billions that they get lost, but there are results. And that is the test we have to meet every day. Thank you, Axel. I wanted to turn out to Jeff. Um, Jeff, you lead the U.S. engagement uh, with the World Bank. Uh, the U.S. is the largest shareholder of the bank and holds the presidency. I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on the changes that are needed within the World Bank, but to secure and ensure U.S. interests. Maybe I'll... Hello. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be with, uh, with an esteemed panel and with a great, uh, a great crowd. Um, I think a good place to start uh, in answering that question is, um, is uh, taking us back to uh, where we were in the fall. I think when we, when, when, and this was the, the first uh, you know, kind of big set of annual meetings that uh, this administration um, participated in, and the secretary in his statement to the development committee uh, was quite forthcoming in what he needed to see in terms of a, a reformed and uh, an improved World Bank group uh, to kind of warrant consideration of, uh, of additional capital. And I think as Olin mentioned, this is, this, this, what was laid out was a, was a very high bar. Um, it's, uh, it, was, it was a very high bar because uh, a high bar is what we expect uh, our international institutions to, to aim for and, and, and hopefully to achieve. Um, I think before I get to kind of the details of, of the package and, 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 and what, uh, what is being uh, considered, um, it's important to consider that in, in the state of the world as it is today, most of the, uh, of the, of the larger borrowers from the World Bank, um, 
the World Bank is not the dominant supplier of uh, of of, uh, of investment, uh, and 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 I think that's that there that you have to somewhat rationalize then um, how impactful is the bank's marginal dollar uh, in those countries, and so that leads to questions about. Uh, graduation, uh, as, as, as what's been mentioned, um, and uh, and what can be done to encourage that, but also how do you stretch kind of the limited amount of public resources that uh, that are invested in these institutions? And to that end, the the centerpiece of uh, of uh, of what um, uh, of what's before us is is a strategy where uh, uh, there's an allocation framework that directs uh, the resources towards the poorest clients, so arguably where the marginal dollar is most impactful. Uh, a sweeping pricing reform policy that will encourage, uh, you know, uh, countries to pursue graduation or private alternatives uh, when, when they can. And this lends itself to kind of keeping the World Bank relevant and influential and impactful in the world uh, at a time when there are there is a lot of uh, competition both by other institutions uh, and by uh, by private flows. I think. Um, uh, in terms of U.S. leadership and support of these institutions, I'll point you to um, the Secretary's testimony last week before, uh, before Congress, where he said that he very much supports these institutions. To that end, uh, Treasury worked very hard uh, with Axel and, uh, and, uh, and others at the World Bank to negotiate a, a good, a, what we consider to be a very good package uh, to come before governors for, uh, for review uh, and voting. Um, once transmitted, we'll have to undertake a consultative and deliberative process, both within our government, with our budget authorities, but also with Congress, uh, as is uh, as is customary with uh, with prior uh, prior actions in this area. Um, kind of running through what we consider to be the most important uh, elements of this, and quite frankly, things that were uh, uh, um, uh, you know uh, things that were um, high priority items for the United States uh, in in the negotiations was first ensuring a, 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 a structure that uh, requires long-term financial discipline. Uh, I, was, uh, I was working for Congress uh, when the last package came before, uh, before Congress uh, for a capital increase. We were told that this would be the last capital increase for a while, and um, surprise, I'm in this post uh, having to consider another one. And so a high priority item is kind of having some certainty and some discipline in the financial governance going forward. Um, the, what, what, what is before us is a package that effectively caps lending at 2017 levels uh, and would allow organic capital accumulation alone to sustain the bank for, for the uh, indefinite future. Um, as I said before, we're directing 70% of, uh, of, the, of the lending volume towards poor clients, which is a, a, a very positive development. Um, we've extracted these commitments for, for pricing reforms, um, including differentiation by income level, uh, which is a, uh, a major uh, policy achievement in our view. Um, we are uh, securing commitments to calibrate engagement by the bank with, uh, with countries that are at or above the graduation threshold. So countries that have the means to access uh, private markets and, uh, and are relatively wealthier um, the bank will be more systematic in its application of what currently is actually quite a strict graduation policy, but um, but is not consistently applied. And uh, I think there are there are there are new commitments for the bank to tailor its engagement with these countries as they move through the uh, through their uh, up the development ladder. And finally, uh, something that's important uh, to the U.S. is is, uh, is efficiency of, of World Bank and other uh, international institutions operations. Uh, we've secured uh, uh, very good uh, commitments to um, do further cost reductions at the World Bank, uh, including um, particularly through compensation measures uh, and through uh, performance management reform. So, um, in our view, these are all these are all uh, uh, positive developments. These this is um, quite frankly uh, more reform uh, that we've seen extracted in this package uh, and in this negotiation than we have seen in, in prior in prior negotiations and um, and to. to in my personal view, uh, but I think in the view of the of the Treasury Department, um, this is a good decision for to come before governors. And as I said, we will undertake a process, uh, undertake a process within our government and with Congress to uh, to thoughtfully consider the resolutions when they're when they're put before us. Thank you, Jeff. Um, let me turn back again to the uh, topic of um, the fragility was was mentioned as a, as one of the core areas that the World Bank is, is working on. Uh, we have, a, uh, according to the OECD, 56 fragile states. Um, we just uh, released a report. Uh, that Ambassador Michael is here, the author. 
Um, I know that the World Bank is, is doing, um, is pushing for, for fragile states, and Dennis, you've, you've worked in these contexts. Can Axel and Dennis, can you talk about a little bit about how uh, your work is being, I mean, mainly Axel, how you are adjusting your work in order to offer better support to these countries, and Dennis, your views on, on the work on fragile states. Well, it's very clear that um, the, um, the request of the international community is uh, uh, to see the bank no longer just as a bystander and wait. And we have uh, certainly over the years uh, scaled this up. But I think the extent of the problem is much, much bigger. So during the IDA 80 negotiations, we made a commitment to double our engagement that goes from about $7 billion to $14 billion of resources. That's only the country allocation. Then on top of that, we have created a uh, refugee window of another $2 billion. And we have a, a crisis response window that is accessible to all but likely they will also benefit, uh, uh, these countries could benefit from that as well. Uh, for example, uh, last year we prepared the $1.8 billion package for famine affected countries and they happen to be almost all fragile countries. So uh, you could see these resources increase to almost 20 billion and, and we have a private sector window where we help IFC and MIGA to de-risk investments, not where it is easy, but it is in the IDA only, and particularly the fragile countries, because nobody wants to invest. Because, so somewhere you need to start taking more risk. And, and, and these. So what, what that actually means is also transforming, uh, if you wish, the business model. So you need to be more on the ground. We are in all those countries, but you need to have e uh, stronger representation there and you need to work uh, across the spectrum think of this on the refu uh, on refugees there are UN agencies there are bilateral agencies you need to uh, make that happen so this is actually an, uh, an, an enormous challenge but it is also uh, the expectation is that we are not looking on uh, band-aid only solutions. We need to s start also looking wherever it's possible to start, uh, look at sustainable solutions. And in that sense, again, how do you create, for example, jobs? How do you work with the private sector? As difficult as this is, but it is, uh, I think the question is now, how are you going to do it? And this is going to also lead to a different type of work between the IFC and the World Bank, so that it has to be a lot more there together on how you actually uh, can complement each other. Uh, so this is, uh, and, and what you are seeing is some of the challenges we have, uh, to be honest, is um, uh, where either resources may not be sufficient. Take uh, the, in previous time, it would be only in post-conflict situations, but so, the, so the, the conflict had stopped. But like in a country like Afghanistan, uh, when you have still fighting going on, or take Yemen, then these, uh, these needs are unlimited. So there we had to be helped by a complementary trust fund, the Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund, because the resources are uh, uh, simply not enough what IDA could provide. So that is certainly a, 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 a key challenge. We have then to look at uh, the, the issue uh, of middle income countries. I, I'm thinking here about particularly Iraq, but also think of, of the refugee situation. Venez well, Venezuela is right now, but this is also a very critical. One. What are you doing with all the refugees in the neighboring countries? So um, we have, in the IDA context, have uh, put aside a $1 billion for uh, the potential reconstruction of, uh, of uh, Syria once the situation is there. But at the same time, you also see uh, the neighboring countries like Jordan and Lebanon struggling to support all those things. So these are the, the issues where we are being asked and we are active on this on the ground, but also with support program. Clearly, uh, the name of the game is excellent coordination. 
and I think it's also interesting is again on the security and 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 development uh, is how uh, when things are uh, uh, when there is peace like take in the north of Iraq how can you actually move in with development project rather than have people unemployed in the streets on this that are the difficult things and these are the things we have to, uh, have to, to, to start uh, moving on uh, uh, very quickly. And I think here we have actually a good record on this. We, we, we're working very closely with uh, certainly the bilaterals, also in, in those cases with the US, but also with other agencies that are engaged. And I think we will need to do more of that. Dennis, I wanted to hear your thoughts from your experience and your um just written a book about this topic, so can you please give your comments? Thank you, Romina, and I want to thank Romina and Dan for the privilege of being here, and underscore a point that uh, Olin made, which is that there are many people in this audience that would be more effective on this panel than I am, so I apologize to all of you and hope that you raise some interesting questions going forward. Uh, let me also start with a couple of uh, facts about myself, okay? It's been a dozen years since I was at the bank, and while I doubt it's changed much, it could have changed a lot. So, because I, I, the other side is I've been out of Washington for the last 30 years, more or less. So I tend to see these things not from an inside the beltway perspective, but from a way outside the beltway perspective. And that, I trust me, it's very different. The other thing is, as Romina suggested, um, after I left the bank, I got involved with the U.S. military, and I worked in Iraq and Afghanistan, and. Fascinatingly to me, it opened up a whole new perspective of working in fragile states. Because I was doing governance and development work for the 173rd Airborne in, uh, in Iraq. And, and I mean, we were out in, on the coal face, and it was really uh, utterly fascinating. But I think it underscores the, the work in, uh, in war torn countries are simply at one extreme of the challenge of working in fragile states more generally, okay? And I think if fragile states sort of epitomize the challenge that the World Bank and the development community at large face. And I want to put this in the context of a conflict of, of uh, time frames. In order to be successful politically, uh, development agencies like the World Bank have to do something that they can say, I did this today. The, the time frame that they have to deliver on it for Congress is extremely short. But if you stop to think about it, development is at least a medium-term process, okay? So you can deliver global welfare quickly, but you cannot deliver global development because global development requires that you create institutions in countries that can do for themselves. When I was with the World Bank, I used to tell my colleagues, we've won when the only thing the countries we need, that we deal with need is money. That should be our goal. We should be working ourselves out of a business. But of course, the incentives are to do exactly the opposite. And you see that in spades in countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. The donor community completely overwhelmed these countries. And it, uh, go, the, go to non-conflict places, it's teamwork, same exact thing. Aussie completely took over the country in terms of advisors and money. And then there's, you know, none of this in a sense costs much to the country, so why say no? And yet it builds no capacity. In fact, it undermines capacity. I wrote a paper coming out of, of uh, East Timor that was entitled Capacity Stripping, How the International Community Destroys Capacity in, De in Fragile States. And I, I've seen it, so I, it's right there. Um, and I, I want to just also add, there's been a lot of discussions uh, of, in this wonderful conference on de-risking de investment. But we need to be very careful what aspects of risk get associated with whom. We really want the international community to help reduce sovereign risk. And that takes institutions and good governance and all that stuff. But that, you, you can't, it, if you want it to be effective on the ground, You've got to give the institutions time to develop in the countries, and you've got to give countries incentives. And it's, it's especially true in, in uh, conflict situations, 
The incentive structure that countries face is if I don't do it, it'll get done for me tomorrow by the international community. And that is no way to create capacity. So I think the, the pressure for the World Bank to increase its role in fragile states is correct. But doing it is, is very hard because it faces, in some sense, conflicting uh, signals from its uh, enabling environment. You know, be effective in fragile states, but do something today. And in my judgment, that's a very dangerous recipe. So thank you. So we, we mentioned, um, you know, the emergence of uh, private capital, uh, the need to work in fragile states. And there's another uh, trend that we have, um, you know, new competitors or, or new actors in, in, in the development arena. And China is both a borrower of the World Bank and is also has its own, um, you know, it set up its own uh, development banks. I wanted to ask Olin, um, how do you see the World Bank, um, you know, addressing, and, and then and Axel as well, uh, China in a constructive way? Well, on the, uh, I think there are two components to it. Uh, one is uh, China's long-term uh, engagement uh, as a shareholder, uh, as a uh, contributor and donor uh, to World Bank uh, activities. Uh, the other is the uh, question of the graduation. And um, on that latter, uh, I think certainly when viewed uh, against a standard related to access to international capital markets, uh, there is, in my view, a clear case for a short pathway to graduation. And I say that uh, recognizing that um, uh, net transfers back to the bank are, uh, are, uh, are increasing uh, uh, from China. And um, uh, also, the bank needs China's uh, engagement. Uh, they need, uh, as, as Axel said uh, earlier, uh, their participation as a, as a donor. Uh, so there needs to be sensitivity to the constructive role uh, that China can play. We do need an inclusive uh, international uh, system. Uh, we must not uh, fragment. Uh, and um, so we want to do it sensitive to uh, China's uh, longer term participation in the bank. Uh, but I think, I think a consistent, uh, transparent, uh, well-articulated uh, graduation program uh, measured against access to uh, international capital needs to be put in place. And it needs to be put in place broader than simply China, uh, because there are many other countries that uh, are in that same uh, uh, situation if the primary criteria is uh, uh, per capita uh, GDP. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Argentina, I think you've got Brazil, you've got Mexico, uh, maybe Kazakhstan, a uh, number of others. Um, but there, there should be a, uh, a, uh, a broad policy uh, that uh, seeks to move countries down a pathway uh, with transparency and with uh, organized uh, structure and uh, fairly quickly. So the um, graduation debate has always been with us since the beginning. Um, it has always been an issue. Um, and uh, it is always a difficult issue when, you are, when a country is in a double position of being a recipient, a recipient of World Bank resources as well as a donor. This has happened with many countries. Take Australia, take Japan, take Finland, take Spain. There are many. Um, in fact, uh, in the case of uh, Japan, um, in the early 60s, they, were represent they, they received about 19% of the resources of the World Bank while being also becoming a donor. So these are things, what I call transition times, and we have had a very successful journey with China. 
that has allowed, and let's also keep the results, is the World Bank has been uh, a lead partner in helping China to uh, move to a market economy or and, 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 and has also reduced enormously poverty. Now there is a new stage and it's an evolving uh, uh, relationship. Um, I think that what we are seeking is with all these countries that are going through the different phases that they are then uh, assuming new roles within the bank. And one is also to become a donor to, to IDA, what ha they have done. And they have also started to accelerate repayments and even make voluntary repayments. And that has to be welcomed. So one of the things is in within the, 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 uh, the discussion about a, a graduation is first and foremost is that there is equity of treatment on the membership. It's very important that we are not singling countries out. It can be a small country, it can be a big country. We will need to make sure that we are not discriminatory. And then uh, have uh, the criterion uh, looked at it. There are different criteria of the, the World Bank policy. It's not only the GNI per capita, it's also access to finance as well as institutional development. So there, is, uh, there are different criteria that are being uh, discussed. And I think as Jeffrey mentioned, it is about the systematic application of this. And, and I think that will be uh, one of this. So I think therefore, um, I think one needs to, to do this also with the country. Um, and I, I understand when you say, well, there is a time, I, I think I, I, I'm fine, everybody can have a timetable. I think what uh, the country affected is also entitled to have a view. So we need to make sure that basically we listen to all the guy and then actually find uh, um, uh, good solutions on this. I, I also think that uh, it is uh, important to see that again in the bank we are living uh, not necessarily uh, in the world, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, also tensions, competitive tensions, and we should recognize that how the World Bank provides a platform for good dialogue and what we would like to have sustained dialogue. You can always br uh, uh, burn bridges. So what we need to do is how we keep there the whole membership in a form that, uh, that, uh, that is not always easy. And having gone through a couple of negotiations um, for the World Bank, this is the challenge, that you bring uh, maybe equal happiness or equal unhappiness, to have, but we need to have, an, at the end, a deal that everybody signs off. Because I think we should not have alienating deals where basically people say, this is not good for the World Bank, it's not good for the world. So that is where, where the challenge is. I tell you also in the IDA uh, uh, framework, there is also a graduation debate. It is never easy. So, but what we, I would say is the bank has been able to find good solutions. One thing I want to keep you only on the IBRD side that you keep that in mind, is there is, if you look uh, historic, we have about uh, a little bit less than 25 countries have graduated from the IBRD through time. If you actually look when they graduated, they were about 50% at uh, uh, that uh, income level of the US in PPP terms. And so one of the things is, it's interesting when you look at that, and, and what you have also to, to be careful of, like in Ida, you can graduate sometimes country at a lower level, but you have also then reverse graduations. And we have seen that in IBRD and Ida, we should learn the lessons from it. So we need to have an, uh, an, a, 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 a systematic approach, but we should keep all the, all the factors in mind uh, uh, for the long-term relationship of the World Bank. It's very important. Just very briefly, if you don't mind. Uh, the discussion of Ch China just brings home to me the fact that if you spend a lot of time in any parts of Asia, you get a very different perspective on China than you, if you have a conversation here about China. I've spent the last, I can't believe this, but 17 years living in, in, in uh, Kazakhstan. 
and uh, working in Central Asia. And I've been to China many times during that time period. I have never been to a country that is so utterly focused and, and managed on what they want to get. And they're, the, the, uh, Asia is just their current uh, influence uh, sort of focus, but they've got much bigger plans. I would tell you in my personal judgment from being outside this, that China is currently winning the battle. People are, are afraid of what China's ultimate objectives are, but the terms are still good enough that they accept them. And they've, and I, you know, it's not just the Belt and Road Initiative, which is extraordinary. It's the soft power stuff. They've started something called the Asian University Alliance, which is clearly, and they're putting a lot of money behind this, okay? Clearly an effort to draw the universities of the, of the region together as part of a in, uh, China influence. So I think, if to put it bluntly, in my view, we need China more than China needs us. And I certainly believe they feel that way. So we need to be very careful dealing with China in a, in a multilateral context. Hello, there we go. Um, I think as you rightly point out and as others have, we have a, an interesting situation where China is both a very large borrower uh, at multilateral institutions and a very large purveyor of bilateral credit globally. Um, it's kind of unique uh, in its status, uh, being able to, to claim both of those titles. And I think, you know, as it relates to graduation in China that, that Olin brings up, I think too often graduation is viewed as a very negative con context that, um, that uh, we are taking off the training wheels, per se. And, and really, the way I think we should look at it is uh, it's an achievement of, uh, of, uh, of a status where you can finance uh, your own development needs going forward. Um, uh, Axel brings up a point on, on GDP uh, per capita and the comparison. In today's world, I don't know if I if I entirely agree with that as being the benchmark, because um, uh, really it's about capacity and, um, and 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 how much capacity you have to continue growing on your own and financing your own needs, uh, as opposed to kind of a, a relative benchmarking, uh, in my view. I, I do, but I do think you know to Olin's point on on China uh, or or really emergent creditor practices generally in in in, in the world. Uh, we, we do have we do face an issue here, and, and this this gets to um, the heart of, of how our international system is constructed, and that is we have credits flowing from some of these countries uh, that are quite uh, non-economic in their motivations. Um, the standards are inconsistent uh, for projects if there if there are any at all. Um, there are um, procurement policies that may or may not uh, be fair and and and, and warranted, and. These are to governments, largely sovereign loans, uh, to governments that may not have the capacity to evaluate their contingent liabilities um, on financial terms that may or may not be disclosed. And so, and at the end of the day, these credits are being incurred uh, by countries and the restructuring mechanisms for them. Uh, we, well, we welcome and want China to become a member of the Paris Club and adhere to its standards that currently, uh, that currently is not entirely the case. And so. Um, I think we have a question before us in terms of all the credit flowing generally, whether it's from the World Bank or IFC uh, or, or others, as to how do, we, how do we deal with this as a development challenge, um, also as a financial challenge, uh, kind, of, kind of going forward. And, and the last thing I'll say is I think there's a lot of, a lot of question or, or from a strategic perspective about what do we do with this as, as the United States. And I guess the only thing I'd caution is um, we shouldn't view are needing to compete dollar for dollar as a strategy, right? Um, I think uh, the, the, the points I've laid out, at least as the way I see it, and I think the way many see it, um, may not end well. And I don't know if, if, uh, if, uh, if all want to follow that exact same path, but I think that, gives, that gives, um, gives support to the reason why I think the Secretary says that we stand by uh, and support our multilateral institutions, the ones that we're members of and the ones that uh, we're leaders in. May I build on uh, a couple of your comments, if I could, Jeff? It seems to me that uh, uh, a, uh, a takeoff from the graduation uh, issue as it relates to China uh, could be a broader uh, negotiation that sweeps in other uh, development-related issues. 
Um, anytime uh, one is talking about a transition, if one accepts the view that uh, borrowing by China would not end immediately, in other words, they continue to derive benefit, uh, that we should be able to enter into a constructive uh, negotiation that uh, addresses a number of uh, components of their bilateral uh, development policy as well as their participation in multilateral lending institutions. Let me leave you with that uh, uh, undefined thought but uh, it does not seem to me that addressing this issue with China need result in some kind of cataclysmic uh, uh, endpoint. Well, um, we don't have much time for um, Q&A, but I want to thank all the panelists uh, for being here and uh, all of you participants. We have some a coffee break now, and if you want to continue a little bit the conversation, um, I think they can stick around for little uh, while. So thank you very much.